Hi, friends. Thanks for joining us. We have a special episode this evening. We're not even going to number this episode. We are with, arguably, the greatest Blue Bomber of all time, one of the greatest mm. CFL players of all time, the man who has a street named after him, uh, the man who provided so many great memories uh, in the stadium behind me. Winnipeg, can't thank y'all enough. Uh, Milt Stiegel, welcome to Rain Benny Talk Sports. Wow, I appreciate that uh, that opening. I wish my wife would say those great things about me now, but we've been married over two decades, so I think she's fed up with me. But no, it's good to be here. It's good to be here. Fair <laughs> enough. Fair. We, we can go into the stats too, but uh, let, let's just get into it. We want to get to know you on a different level. We've seen all the stats. We've seen all the highlights. We've seen you on TV doing your thing on TSN. But you know, tell us about that journey, especially from Cincinnati to Green Bay, the injuries, and then finding yourself in Winnipeg. Yeah, it, it was a journey, uh, and I wouldn't change anything about it. You know, there, there were some rough patches, but, you know, that, that's life, regardless of what you do for a living. Uh, when you're trying to get to a certain place uh, that's difficult to get to, you know, there's going to be some rough patches. So you spoke of it. You know, I started my professional career with my hometown, uh, Cincinnati Bengals. Uh, I thought it was a, a dream come true, and it was uh, a dream come true because I was getting an opportunity uh, to play in the NFL, you know, very few people get that opportunity, especially getting to play for my hometown team. So, uh, you know, being a free agent, it, it was a tough battle to make the team. But I made the team. I stayed there for three years. But uh, long story short, I always tell people the only two good things I got out of playing in the NFL was a pension and a 401k uh, because it, it, it wasn't it wasn't fun. You know, when you're on the bottom of the totem pole, three years on a losing team, every time you come in, you're thinking, is this my last day? You know, they're working out guys all the time, you know, revolving door. So the fact that I was able to get three years in uh, was a blessing. I got all my benefits. I mean, shucks. Next year, I can start receiving my pension at 55. So I'm blessed to have that. I'm, I'm, I had some pretty good friends I made out of that also. But as far as having fun playing football, that really wasn't the case. I really didn't get that much time to play receiver. You know, it was basically, you know, special teams running down on kickoff. And, and and punt team returning punts and kicks and all the everything I hated to do about football I had to do <laughs> in the NFL so that was the journey and then my contract was up there I signed with the Green Bay Packers uh 95 and uh I got hurt like the second day of training camp I went through all the offseason workout program I stayed up there for months you know was doing well was uh carving out a, possibly a spot on that team maybe the fourth or fifth receiver and I got hurt the second day of training camp, and that was pretty much it. Because I healed up. Mm. Uh, it was like three weeks later, and training camp was over, and they basically said, you know, we have to release you. We have nothing to evaluate you on. So uh, thank you for your services, but you're gone. So after that, I pretty much thought my, you know, football career was over. I was about to go enter the real world, get a real job, or maybe, you know, go back to school, get my master's, get some more education, do something like that. But then my agent called me up and uh, as I tell the story, tell, told me I had a, a team in the CFL that had my rights. I didn't know exactly what that meant, you know, had my rights. You know, what does that mean? Well, as a team in CFL wants you to come up there and play for them. And if you want to play in the CFL, you have to go to this team. So now, next question was, who's the team? And his answer was Winnipeg. And my exact words, I say this all the time. I said, what's a Winnipeg? <laughs> what is a Winnipeg? I have no idea. <laughs> Like, what is a Winnipeg? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, you know, 1995, uh, uh, history or geography. I, I didn't, I knew about Toronto. I knew about Vancouver. I knew about uh, Montreal. I've been, I've been in Toronto and Montreal, but I had no idea about Winnipeg. And so at the time I decided, you know, I was 25. I said, hey, I'll give it a shot. You know, if I want to continue playing football, this has to be the road I have to go now because no NFL teams were calling me. Uh, and I, like I always tell people, the moment I signed that contract, uh, besides marrying my wife and having my kids, was the best decision I ever made in my life. You know, it it provided so much, uh, not only on the field, but off the field, and that allowed me to be the person and, and the man and the football player I was and the analyst that I am today. Yeah, yeah. Benny, before, let me just cut in. Can I ask who was your first contact in Winnipeg? Who was the first winnipeg blue bomber organizational person that you talked to and what was your first impression did that make you excited about coming uh well it was actually paul jones who's still working in the cfl he was actually the 
the head scout, and he was the one who uh, scouted me when I was in uh, in the mini camps and in the training camps with Green Bay. And I remember he he told me the story that he told Cal Murphy, "There's a guy that you need to bring up here." And Cal Murphy was like, "Where well, is he fast?" And Paul Jones was like, "He's not fast, but he can make plays." And you know, Cal Murphy didn't want to want me out there because he felt I want I need some speed. I need some speed. I need some wow. fast guys and. You know, I I wasn't I was running a four or five mid four. I wasn't the fastest guy, but I was not going to get caught. There was when I got in the game, you weren't yeah. going to catch me. So Don't it was Paul it. Jones who I had the first conversation. But I was still leery about it. I was going to a place I didn't know of. You know, I hadn't seen any uh, CFL games on TV. I heard about it. You know, Doug Flutie, Warren Moon, those guys. But I, I've never seen a CFL game on TV, so I had no clue what I was getting into. What uh, what month did you arrive in, in Winnipeg when you came here? Before I arrived in September. It's, September, but it was cold. It, it was cold. <laughs> I, I remember I got off the plane and I was like, "Hold on, it, it's September, right?" And I got off the plane and it was it, it, it was chilly because I remember. I, and and the crazy thing about it, I got off the plane, and I went to the facility, and you know, coming from the NFL, I thought I was going to get a full physical. You know, I was going to go to the hotel and relax. I get to the facility. It's later. I'm on the field practicing. I'm like, hold on, what, what, what is going? I haven't, I haven't, I haven't taken a physical. I haven't done anything, and I'm on the field practicing. And a week and a half later, I'm playing in my first. Not even a week and a half, but like maybe five or six days later, I'm playing in my first game. Wow, that's crazy. So you played half a season there. How do you feel that went? Um, and were you thinking, hey, I'm going to come back next year, or are you still planning on trying to get back to the NFL after that? Yeah, when I when I, when I first got there, my 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 first uh, my my mindset was this is going to be my road back to the NFL. You know, I need to come up here and and tear it up as a receiver because I never get an opportunity, and then I'll get my shot. Uh, I got up there at ninety five, as we just talked about, and I played like the last five or six games, and I was still getting used to the game. I still didn't understand the game uh, because as you get into the season, there's really not much coaching. They didn't have time to coach me, so I'm just out there freestyle and trying to figure things out so we come into 96 and i get get to go through a training camp but i still hadn't figured out the game yet i still had hadn't uh figured out all the nuances all the different ways you can use the waggle and all those things so yeah. uh, i actually only played like 10 or 11 games that year because i tore my mcl so that year wasn't what i thought it was going to be but once 97 came around that's when things opened up to me and people always ask me you know, who was your who was your best head coach? Who did you like the most? And there were some head coaches that I loved the most, but the coach that had the most impact on me was Jeff Reinbold in 1997 mm. because he told me something that changed everything about the way I approached the game. I was I was a leader because the way I approached the game, the way I my work ethic and all those things, but I wasn't a vocal leader. And he told me, it's time for you to take this team over. It's time for you to be that vocal leader. I'm going to put this team on your back. You're going to be the guy that I lean on when things aren't going well. In 1997, 99% of the time, things didn't go well, so he leaned on me a lot. But he allowed me to come out of that, that quote-unquote shell that I was in and become the leader that allowed me to have, you know, the career that I had all the way up to my retirement. It, it's great that you say that because, like, I was about to ask which coach had the biggest impact on you. And of course, as Winnipeg and CFL fans, we probably would not think Jeff Reinbold right away just because uh, of his record. But at the same time, when he came in, he had an energy and he's still in football. He has a, a, an intelligence about the football, uh, about football. So yeah, even as a surprise, it's kind of like, yeah, I can feel his vibe because he had, he had a vibe. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I always say, no one likes losing, but being around Jeff Reinbo with all the things he did, he made losing fun. I know that may be an oxymoron, but Jeff Reinbo made losing fun. He always did something that was going to distract you from when you lost. So that's my man, Jeff Reinbo. Love him to death. <laughs> did he really go for rounds with the players? Sorry, Benny. Go ahead. Did he really go for rounds after a game with players? Well, see, that I, I didn't hang out. I heard he was out hanging out with the players. You know, that wasn't my thing. I, I I didn't hang out, but I heard he was out kicking it. But he was real friendly with some of the guys on the team. So I wouldn't be surprised at all. I wouldn't be surprised at all. Yep. <laughs> Sorry, Benny. Go ahead. 
<laughs> no, that's good. That, I'm just saying that's 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 a good thing that you felt that way about Rymo because obviously, like you said, and we remember there was a lot of losing going on in those years. So it's to me, I'm thinking, you know, what are you thinking? Like, what am I doing here? Why am I here? Kind of thing to lose all these games, right? So that could have been an easy out for you to get out of Winnipeg at that time. But great to hear that about Reinbold because even when we were losing, when we when you guys won those games, we were excited. Even if you were, you know, that was your first win of the season. I still remember the Saskatchewan comeback one. Oh. Um, how crazy we went with uh, Troy Coffey yep. in '98. Yep. Yeah, yep, so. yep, yep, yep. But yeah, I, I wasn't playing in that game because I was just coming back from the NFL. Then I just got back like the day before uh, from trying out with the Saints. So I actually wasn't playing in that game. But I know I was. I was there for it. I was there. For it. Yeah, I was there was, for the game. Yeah, it was like we won the Great Cup that day. <laughs> <laughs> there was a college feel in that stadium. Like people storming the field after when it was awesome. Yeah, no, it was amazing. Jeff Ryan, but like a lot of people thought he was a bad. He wasn't a bad head coach. We just had some horrible players on the team. Whoever the GM was, whoever was picking the players, that was a problem. He was a great coach, great head coach. You ask anybody who's played for Jeff Reinbo, if it be a position coach, special team coach, head coach, every single player loves Jeff Reinbo. It was just the talent we had on the field was not up to par. Yeah. Thanks for shining the light on that. Yeah. A lot of folks don't know that. Yeah. yeah. Um, okay. So you played, obviously, with a lot of quarterbacks. You know, especially in that stretch of the late 90s until Kahari Jones kind of came in and then Kevin Glenn. Um, did you have a favorite who threw the best ball kind of thing? Yeah, they threw me the ball, threw the best ball. <laughs> 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 I mean, I, I mean, of course, Kahari, Kevin, because I had the opportunity to play with them for longer than six or seven games. <laughs> you know, you, you, you talk about you know, throughout my 14 year career with the Winnipeg Blue Rams in the CFL, I think I caught a touchdown from what 14 different quarterbacks. I caught, caught a quarter uh, touchdown from a receiver. I think you guys threw me one or two touchdowns. So it, it, it was like a revolving door, especially, you know, 95, 96, 97, 98, 99. It settled down a little bit in 2000 is when Kahari took over, like, you know, midway through the season. And Kevin Glenn took over after that, where I really had some stability at quarterback. But, I mean, the thing about it is those quarterbacks, Kevin Glenn and Kahari, they were so good because we had a chemistry like no other. We were able to communicate without communicating. You know, I saw the field, I'm not trying to brag, but I saw the field like a quarterback. 50% uh, of the time I was adjusting my routes because I was able to read the defenses. I knew what every single skill player had on every single pass play, so I knew when – to adjust my routes based on what the defense was giving me and based on what the other receivers and running backs were running. So they were able to read me. I was able to read them. And, you know, we were able to create some uh, great things throughout that stretch. Okay. I, I'm going to ride off that, off the great things you created and being able to adjust your routes. Uh, going back to 2004, four seconds left against Edmonton. Can you lead us? Like wrong year, wrong year, two thousand and six. Come on, six, come on. That's the great. That, that's <laughs> the great. That's the greatest play in football history. And you, do we need to start this interview all over? No. Oh, it's not an interview. This is. I can't believe that. I'm, I'm kind of disappointed. Two thousand and six. It's just because it was beside the four seconds. I. I all right. Have it. Sorry. Okay. I apologize. All right. There we go. I forgive you. I Thanks forgive for you. checking me, though. I appreciate that because it is historic. <laughs> Let's go back to that play. Two thousand and six. There we go. Four seconds left in Edmonton. Like, lead us through that play. Was there something that you guys saw before that, or was it truly a Hail Mary down the seam? What happened there? Lead us. Like no, it, 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 it's funny you say that. It was definitely something we saw before that. Uh, you know, we had before that we had like 10 seconds uh, on the first down play, and I ran it, and Kevin threw it up, and we both came. When I came back to the huddle, we looked at each other, and we said, do you see this defense they're playing? We didn't think we had a chance. We never, that never came into our mind. It's, I don't care how optimistic you are. When you're down by, what it was, it? I think four points you know, on your own 10 yard line, a hundred yard touchdown to score, one play left. You never think you're going to score. I don't care how optimistic you are. But we, I came back and we looked at each other like, did you see the defense they're just playing? So we said, let's run the same play. We ran the same play, we threw it up. And as they say, the rest is history. But we had no idea that play was going to work. We had no clue, but we were kind of uh, real skeptical because of that defense. We couldn't believe the defense they were playing. You know, in that situation, his back guy's back. Yeah. Make everything underneath. But 
yeah. they decided to do like a zone blitz. They only had a few guys back, and they allowed us to score the touchdown. When when you were on your way to scoring that touchdown, were you like, "This is unbelievable! I'm I'm going to score. We're going to win this game." Like you were going 100 yards. Like you're saying, like that's crazy to think that they wouldn't have played any different D on that. Well, I actually thought until I got hit in the end zone by Chris Brazel when he hit me hard too. I thought I was dreaming. I literally thought I was dreaming. I was like, there's no way this can actually be happening. There's no way. When he hit me in the end zone and the guys, guys piled on me, that's when I thought it was real. So it was, it, it was a great moment, you know, to share that with so many guys, especially Kevin Glenn, because uh, the plays that happened before that with the fumble, all we needed was the first down, the quarterback sneak, and the game is over, but he just happened to fumble the ball and, they came out and score, and then we had an opportunity. So with everything that happened with that, I mean, that that that's my greatest memory in my football history. Yeah, I remember watching that game and getting upset that you guys were going to possibly lose that game and, you know, ready to turn the TV off. But for some reason, I hung on to watch that last play, and I'm glad I did. <laughs> yeah, it was pretty cool. It was pretty cool. <laughs> Uh, okay, so tell us tell us about your uh, MOP year. Uh, was anything different going into that season, and how did that feel? Well, that that was the year uh, when Kahari and I we were really connecting. You know, he had really uh, uh, figured out you know the CFL game and what it took uh, to be great. Uh, that was Paul Lapolis's first year as our OC, uh, and he came in and originally his plan was. This is the offense. This is the way we're going to run it. And then Kahari and I didn't say anything, but we would just do things in the game and make big plays. And then we, we'd come to the sideline and get, okay. And he would say, okay, I guess that's what we're going to do on some plays. But Kahari and I, I mean, it was a lot of unscripted things. And it goes and goes back to what I alluded to earlier, how we were able to read things uh, and see things that no one else were seeing. There, there was a time where, a running play was called, a draw was called. And Kahari saw that they were going to cover zero, and I saw they were going to cover zero, and he abandoned the draw and threw up a touchdown pass to me. And we come to the sideline, and everybody was like, we're supposed to run the ball. But only Kahari and I saw what was going to happen, and we were able to create those. So it was just some magic going on uh, that uh, allowed us to make those big plays. I was fortunate to have Charles Roberts in the backfield. He took off, uh, took a lot off of me. Uh, Arlen Bruce, uh, Robert Gordon, all these guys were making plays that allowed me uh, to just get some one-on-one -on -one coverage. So, uh, yes, I can pat myself on the back, but we just had a, a great team assembled that year, a great offensive line, and everything was just clicking. It was unfortunate that I got hurt the last game of the year and didn't get the opportunity to make it uh, play in the playoffs, but that year uh, was just something special. There was nothing that no other team could do uh, to stop uh, what we're doing on offense. Spe speaking was of that... Charles Roberts, were you guys the complete opposite in the workout room? I mean, we've heard a lot of things. Oh, workout Charles. room. Char Charles didn't know where the workout room was. But the <laughs> thing about it, I hated Charles Roberts. And I hated him because you know me, my work ethic was crazy. I'm working out, I'm stretching, I'm getting in the cold tub. I'm doing everything I'm supposed to do to prevent injuries, and I'm still getting injured. Whereas Charles, and I'm, I'm not exaggerating, did absolutely nothing. He didn't train. He didn't warm up. I'm not exaggerating. He didn't warm up before games. He didn't stretch. His pregame meal was a Red Bull and two Snickers. But you get him on the field, and he's the most exciting player that I've ever seen in my life. It used to drive me crazy. That I was like, Charles, you got to start doing something. But after a while, I was like, okay, he has this. I'll, I'll tell you another story about Charles. So when C Doug, Doug Barry came in, his thing was, I'm going to treat you like grown men. I'm not going to give you curfew. So we're going to go to Montreal early. Uh, it, was like a, it was like two days before, we, before the game. And all we had was a meeting that day, and the rest of the time was ours. For some reason, they made Charles Roberts my roommate. I don't know why they <laughs> did that. So Charles knew. I didn't indulge in some of the things he liked to indulge in. So we we have that meeting. We check into our hotel room. Like the opening of the game, I didn't see Charles Roberts. I didn't see Charles Roberts for a day and a half, and he was my roommate. He was in Montreal running the street. So I'm heated. I'm mad because we need him to be big in this game, right? So I'm heated. 
Long story short, Charles Roberts goes out and leads us in rushing and receiving in that game. <laughs> After that game, I said, I'm about to start hanging out. I'm about to start hanging out with Charles Roberts if that's what it takes. And that's when I said, hey, what, I, I, there's nothing else I can say this, man. He has it figured out. He has, he has system. it figured out. That's great. Wow. It, it worked for him. Yeah. Was yeah. yeah. he, he was the most amazing athlete I ever I ever dealt with in my life. He was amazing. Yeah. And then the combination with him and Mike Sellers was go ahead, sorry. What's that? The combination of him and Mike Sellers was one of the most dynamic backfields I've ever seen in my life. It was the problem with Mike, he wanted to be he wanted to be a pretty boy. He didn't realize he was 6'3, 260, and ran a four or five. He he wanted to be nimble guy. He wanted to juke guys like Charles. I'm like, just run straight, Mike. But it, it, it was amazing having those two guys in him. It was entertaining too. If yeah. I could tell you all the stories that went on in that locker room with all these guys, oh, it was it was something else. But it was a never, never a dull day dealing with all those guys. It was fun. It was fun. Well, we'll sit here and listen if you want to tell those stories. No, <laughs> they, they, I can't air those stories out. Can't air those stories out. No, no, no. I'd have to, I have to get in a witness protection program if I dared some of that stuff. <laughs> That's fair. That's fair. A uh, little serious question. Was there any point in your time in Winnipeg where you kind of wanted to either try something else or try another city? Because we never heard of anything like that as fans, but just wondering, like, was there any time where you wanted to look at another city maybe? Never. Never in my career did I ever think about that. And it, it started like in 99, and it had more so to do with what I was doing off the field, in the community more so than what I was doing on the field. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I was building myself in the community, and I, of course I was doing some great things on the field, but I felt this is the place that God put me in. This is the, he put me here for a reason. It, it goes beyond football. It goes beyond what I'm doing on the football field, catching passes, uh, making great plays, whatever that may be. It, it was all about what I was doing in the community. And it really was justified. And I always used to tell myself, if I could help one person, I'd have done my job. And in 2002, the stamp was put on the letter where I was, I was, I was at this event giving a speech and afterwards there was a guy who came up to me and said, your words today stop me from killing myself. And once he told me that, I stepped back and said, wow, mm. I'm making a difference. I'm doing something that's gonna uh, leave a legacy way beyond what I'm doing on that football field. I'm, I'm impacting lives. So from that point on, place for me. Now it was, it was a time in, 2005, where Saskatchewan was trying to trade for me. Roy Shivers called me up directly, which was illegal at the time. <laughs> he called me up directly. I'm trying to get you. And he's, he's weren't his exact words. You know Roy Shivers. He's he's colorful with his language, but I don't curse. But he called me up and said, I'm trying to get you over here. I'm trying to make it happen. And I said, okay, I understand. And I would never ask for a trade, but if they trade me, I understand. But, I mean, the things I was doing in the community – I knew that was going to be the place for me, and I knew I was going to be there as long as I could possibly be there. That's awesome. That's good to hear. Okay, so in, in Winnipeg, though, so you didn't go out ever anywhere? Like, what was your other favorite thing to do in this city besides scoring touchdowns out on the field? Yeah, well, very rarely I, I went out. I'm Every now and then, you know, a teammate would say, come on, you know, there there's something going on. We're all hanging out. And I, I, I would go out, but 99% of the time after the game, I went home and I didn't do anything. And you know what? I, I, I kind of uh, slapped myself sometimes and I didn't take advantage of more of the things to do. Not going out. That wasn't me, but just more of the things to do in Winnipeg and Manitoba. I had an opportunity to do so many things, but I had tunnel vision. It was all about trying to be the best football player I could. I, I, I didn't want to look back and say, man, if I would have did this differently, if I would have worked harder there, I was I had too much tunnel vision. Uh, mm -hmm. I didn't take advantage of a lot of people used to ask me, well, we're going, uh, we're going here to, you know, the polar bears, we're going fishing here, we're going to do this. And I always say, no, I, I could be getting better So I, when I get on the football field. So I, I, I kind of slap myself sometimes. I didn't take advantage of that. But besides football, I was either at home or I was at the training facility. Brendan Tamman, the GM at the time, I was like, you don't need my number. You know I'm going to be. I'm going to be at home or I'm going to be in front of him. 
you know, that's true. You ne- you're never anywhere else. But no, I, I never hung. I've been I, the guys forced me to go to the Pony Corral. My 14 hey. years in Winnipeg, I went to the Pony Corral once. There you go. <laughs> so no Palomino evenings. <laughs> no, none of that. None of that. No. And don't get me wrong. I'm a humble guy, but when you look as good as me, you can't just go out. Yeah, you, you wouldn't have, have got out of there. No, <laughs> no. It, 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 it's the gift and the curse looking this good. Yeah, it's the yeah, gift and the curse. <laughs> <laughs> so when did the uh, the broadcast booth come into play? Uh, was that something that you've been kind of working on before uh, you did it full time? Or was it something that kind of you retired and then folks were on you? What, how'd that come into play? Well, in, in, in 2007, do you guys remember Brian Williams? He used to yes. work for a TSN. Yes. CBC. So he was doing it. Yes. CBC and then work for TSN. He was doing an interview with me and he said, I think you have a career in broadcasting if you want one. And when you retire, I thought he was joking. Uh, as I got close to retirement, I received a call and the powers to be at TSN said, hey, give you a shot. So I'm like, wow, it's really going to happen. So after the 2000, I retire. I'm going to 2009 and I'm working for TSN. But the thing I did not understand was there was no preseason. There was no training camp. Mm-hmm. I'm there watching those guys work. And two days later, I'm up on the panel. The way things operate is they're going to throw you in the middle of the ocean and see if you can sink or swim. And for a while, I was drowning. Uh, If not for a couple of people, a guy named uh, Jamie Rydell, who still worked there, a guy named Tony Darchie, who's who's passed away, and most importantly, a guy named Chris Schultz. Mm. If not for those three guys, and most importantly, Chris Schultz, I don't know if I would have made it. Those guys really uh guided me chris schultz he more than guided me he kicked my butt and and f- told me what i needed to do and made sure that i stayed on top of it so i'm in debt to those three guys and especially chris Schultz because it was a struggle it was a struggle i, I had no idea why an earpiece was in my ear they didn't tell me so i'm up there talking next thing you know somebody's talking in my ear i'm like what the heck is going on so it it, it was a learning experience but it, 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 it's been a it's been a, a great ride, you know, going on 16, 17 years now. I went from playing football to now uh, talking and analyzing football. So I can truly say I've never worked a day in my life. Yeah. Any Anything exciting coming up at the panel this year or anything different? Uh, I think we're going to add some different pieces. That, that's the thing about uh, the panel. They left. They, they don't let you know what's going on until <laughs> it's about to happen. Uh, I think some different guys are going to be added. You know, we, we'll add some different wrinkles in there uh, because you you can't stay stacked, even if it's replacing some of the panel members. It, it it is what it is. You you have to stay fresh. You have to do things new. You have to keep up. You can't stay uh, keep doing the same thing. You have to keep moving in the right direction. So uh, there'll be some added pieces. We'll be some wrinkles in there. But at the end of the day, we're in an entertainment business, and we just always try to have. It's funny you say that. Uh, you you provided us with the segue. I'm going to ask you to put your analyst hat and you say that you know you need changes. Uh, you can't stay stagnant. How do you see the Bombers in free agency? Uh, a lot of veterans still need to be signed. Some news today that Jackson Jeffcoat uh, might be looking to test free agency. Yeah. How do you see things yeah. playing out in Winnipeg? Well, one thing I can guarantee you: Dalton Sean will not be a Winnipeg Blue Bomber next year. I guarantee you I will put everything I have. If I could bet on it, I would liquidate everything I have and bet on it. Can't afford to keep Dalton shown. Uh, you got Kenny Lawler, who's getting paid, and he's worth every penny, if not more. Dembski, who's getting paid, and Dalton Schoen, who's going to deserve to get paid big bucks. You can't have three receivers where you're paying over $600,000. This is not going to happen. So Dalton Schoen will either be in – Montreal, Hamilton, or Ottawa. I can just about guarantee that. I haven't talked to him. I've never talked to him. You know, I've seen him on the field, but I can just about guarantee that. You know, it, it, it's just difficult when guys are playing well. Yes, they're loyal to a point. You understand that, but they also, they, they want to fill those pockets up. They want to put some extra money in those pockets. Uh, Hardrick, he hasn't signed yet. You know, what's going on with that? You talked about Jeff Coat. Uh, he's going to test the waters. It's just, it's, it, it's just difficult 
Uh, and it's crazy that they were able to hold those guys together for that long. That's mm-hmm. testament to to those powers to be there, to Mike O'Shea, to to Wade Miller, uh, to to the to Kyle, to those guys doing that. But you can see now, hey, those wheels, as they say, are starting to fall off because guys are going to start moving. But uh, well, what they have there with the scouting department, uh, with Danny and those guys, they know how to find guys. And they're going to have to find some guys because they're going to lose some guys. That's a guarantee. They're going to lose some guys. Yeah. What are your thoughts on uh, Brady Oliveira? He's going to be back. Brady, Brady's going to be back. I, I look at him from a standpoint from my career. Somebody offers you extra $50,000 game by playing your entire career in Winnipeg, being a Winnipeg boy, $50,000, $60,000 won't come close to what you're going to make. So Brady Oliveira is going to be back. I think he's just trying to uh, pit some other teams so he can get as much money as he can. But Brady Oliveira, in my opinion, it would not be a wise move for him to leave Winnipeg because there's so much more that he can do, not on the field, but off the field, the opportunities that will come his way if he remains a blue bomber the entire career. Yeah, yeah I totally agree on that one. Yep. yep. Any thoughts on the, the Chris Strebler rumbling, rumblings? Uh, perhaps him yeah, coming the, back north, the, maybe one to come the, back that, that, that That's a difficult situation because I don't think Chris Strebler is coming back up here to be a backup. And maybe they'll tell him, well, you know, Zach only has a couple of more. Chris Strebler is not trying to sit down. He's not trying to sit down. He's been sitting down long enough in the NFL. Uh, I think he achieved his ultimate goal was, was, you know, get his pension. That's great. But he wants to play some football. He hasn't played football in, what, three years now? He wants to play some football. And it would be nice if he came back to Winnipeg. You know, he he has a following there like no other. But I don't know if he wants to come back up and be a backup and make backup money if someone is going to offer him a big deal. Is, is someone going to offer him big? I don't know. Mm-hmm. A lot of people don't think Chris Strebler is a starting quarterback in the CFL, unless something has changed. I mean, based on what we saw when he left, he wasn't a starting quarterback. He's a good changeup. He gets out there, and he's a bulldozer, but is he an every-down, drop-back quarterback that you can depend on that can, you know, get you three, 400 yards, throw you four or, 500, four or five touchdowns on a consistent basis? Can he do that? Based on what we saw before he left, no. So mm-hmm. it remains to be seen uh, if and uh, which team he'll be on next year. What are your what are your thoughts on Drew Brown? You think he'll have success in Ottawa? We'll see. We we the, the sample we've seen of Drew Brown, it just hasn't been that much. It, it's it's hard to say. And you never want to see anyone fail, but it's difficult to say. It's difficult. The pressure's on him now. You know, when he went in those games when Zach got hurt, there was no pressure on him. Right. You know, you were going in, no one's expecting much out of you know that first game he played last year, he tore it up. But then that second game, they won, but he didn't play too well. Now he's, he's expected to be their guy. He's expected to be their starter. He's expected to go out there and help his team win because there's a lot of pressure on him, but there's even more pressure on their GM and their head coach because if they don't get it done soon, in those first eight or nine games, there may be some changes. So let's hope he goes out there and plays well, but we just hadn't seen enough to say which way or what's going to happen or if he's going to be great. We just hadn't seen that, but let's hope he does. Not only for Ottawa's sake, but just for the CFL's sake yep. in yep. general, because we need our young quarterbacks to continue playing with. Yeah. yeah. You talk about young quarterbacks. What are your thoughts and how do you see the situation in Edmonton shaking down with Trey Ford and McLeod Bethel Thompson? Uh, a lot of people are, are disappointed that they signed McLeod. I would have made the same move. I would have made the same move. Trey Ford, uh, I think, will be quarterback people were saying you know comparing him to damon allen let's hold off on that right now he's going to be that but winning the gray cup trey Ford, i don't think he can do that for it cloud beckle thompson we know what he can do we know he led besides the last three minutes of the gray cup in 2020 20, 2022 he was the man he's led this team in in passing yards he's led this this league in in passing touchdowns and as we talked about in Ottawa, these Elks, they need to win. Chris Jones, pressure is on him. His first two years, total of eight victories, four each year, pressure is on him. He needs a guy who can help him win. Now, he'll get Trey in there. He'll have some packages for him, but he knows what he's getting out of McLeod Bethel Thompson. When he was in 2021 in Toronto coaching, 
He saw McLeod Bethel Thompson. He knows what he's getting. So I understand this move 100%. I wouldn't be surprised, though, uh, uh, if he allows Trey to get some run, brings him in, changes up things, because he has a skill set you can't teach, you can't coach against. But McLeod Bethel Thompson is their guy as long as he's out there getting it done. Nice. Any any other crazy predictions uh, for CFL free agency that you see? Anyone leaving a team, going somewhere else? You know what? I, I, it's interesting to see what's going to happen with some of those guys in Toronto. Now that their defensive coordinator, Corey Mason, Saskatchewan, you know, you, you got Pickett, uh, defensive player of the year, and they haven't signed him back yet. I think mm-hmm. he wants to get some good money, and he's deserving of it. They got a couple of defensive linemen. A.J., well, that he hadn't signed yet. What's yeah. going on with him? You know, it's difficult to sign all these guys back. But I also want to tell you, a lot of these guys think they're going to get all this money. It very rarely happens in the CFL. You have a few guys who are going to get the big bucks, but for the most part, it's not going to happen, guys. Let me advise you, it's not going to happen. <laughs> but let's hope they get as much as they can because you only can play this game so long. Uh, and and I hopefully uh, they'll be able to get as much as they can while they can. So yep. with all these moving pieces in free agency, do you see the Bombers continuing their domination of the West and going to the Cup? Uh, that window is, is is getting close. It's getting close to closing, but I think it, it's still open. It's still open. Uh, Zach, you know, we know what he can do, uh, but people are saying regular season Zach. What happens to postseason Zach? He struggles a little bit, but you know, in the regular season, he's a beast. They still have some some of their main pieces there. They are getting older. Uh, Willie Jefferson still dominant. Uh, Big Hill uh, can still get it done. You know, Kenny Lawler, Wolitarski, Dembski, uh, Elavera. He's going to be back there. That makes a big difference. I would love for them to get Hardrick back so they can have just about that entire defensive line intact. But you know, other teams are starting to catch them. They're catching them because they're losing pieces and they're getting older. Let's be honest. The older you get, the more difficult it is. Father time is undefeated. Believe me, I know firsthand. And as you get older, I don't care how much you work out, how healthy you eat, it gets more difficult to stay at the top of your game. So, of course, teams are catching up because, like I alluded to, they're losing pieces. They're getting older. So we'll just have to see what happens. If they can keep that stronghold and make it to the Grey Cup, you're in a row. We, we, I got to ask you about Zach Claros because we've spoken a few times about his playoff performances and the great cop performance. Any idea or thoughts on why that happens uh, in the playoffs? Is it just a long season or are teams starting to figure out the Bombers offense as the season goes on? That, that That's uh, the million dollar question. And I don't know if anyone can answer it, but Zach. Uh, but now what's going to happen is I'm guarantee you, if they get back to that point, it's going to become mental now. Uh, because he's going to be thinking about it. People are going to be asking him about it. That's all they're going to be asking him about. They're not going to ask about it. They're going to ask about, remember your performances in past postseason, and if they make it to the Grey Cup and past Grey Cups, are you thinking about that? It becomes mental. Because we know physically he can get it done. We've seen what he's done in the regular season. You know, a two-time MOP, he gets it done. It's just once he gets to that point, something happens. And I don't know if anyone knows. I don't even know if he knows. You know, it's it's just something that happens. And it's unfortunate because and I, you're not putting it all on him, but a big reason why they haven't been able to win uh, the last two was because of his play. And mm-hmm. if they want to get back there and win it again, it's going to have to be him, regardless of what everyone around him is doing in the CFL. If your quarterback isn't balling, it's not going to happen. So let's hope he gets back to that point. And when he gets back to that point, he has a better performance. Yeah. I totally agree that, that you definitely can't put it all on Zach because there were a couple drives, both against Montreal and Toronto in Grey Cups late in the game that killed the Bombers. So with that said, what kind of impact do you think Jordan Younger will have on this defense as a new coordinator? Oh, he'll have, he'll have a big impact. You know, Jordan Younger uh, was ready to be a defensive coordinator two or three years ago. And I think that's why they made him a defensive coordinator because soon someone's going to come, someone's going to come in and say, Okay, you guys aren't going to make him a defensive coordinator. We are. Uh, and, and, and it's amazing uh, that they have a coaching staff there who understands that. Richie Hall, one of the most amazing uh, people in the world, took a step back. And not many people would do that, but he took a step back and allowed Jordan Younger 
uh, to be that defensive coordinator. And Joe, Jordan Younger is still going to lean, lean on Richie Hall because he's been around the game. But he's going to be an awesome, awesome defensive coordinator. You think about the uh, the impact he's had on his defensive backs, uh, the best defensive backfield year in and year out, putting guys in the NFL, all-stars. He knows how to coach. And now he's going to be in total control. And I don't think much is going to change. I mean, he's learned so much under Richie Hall. He had, had his wrinkles in there. Uh, just like uh, uh, that any defensive coordinator off or offensive coordinator would do once taken over. But he's learned so much under Richie Hall. I mm -hmm. think as far as the structure goes, it'll be the same. But he'll add his little wrinkles in there. But he, he's going to do a great job. He's a very intelligent guy. He knows uh, CFL defenses. He knows CFL offense. He's been around the game for so long. So I'm really excited for uh, what Jordan Younger is going to do. Yeah, and he's going to have a lot of new guys possibly on that back end because right now – what is there, two DBs signed, I think, right? So Yeah, 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 too. yeah. He has one of the most underrated uh, players in the CFL, Evan Holm. Evan Holm is a nightmare. Yeah, Evan Holm can play. So it's good they still have him back there. Yeah. Uh, let's, let's flip over to the NFL. Uh, let's get All right. your uh, Super Bowl predictions. I've kind of seen them already out there. You're you're going with Kansas City or what? Oh man, I'm I'm going with Patrick Mahomes. It's not Kansas City. It's Patrick Mahomes. The only person he loses to in the Super Bowl is who? Tom Brady. That's it. That's it. <laughs> every every everyone else, he's good. I, I I I wouldn't bet against. And I'm not. I don't bet, but I would not bet against Patrick Mahomes. I know uh, Mr. Irrelevant uh, Purdy is is playing some great ball, and he showed out. He showed out this last game. Ebo Samuels is a nightmare. The defense is playing well. But as long as Patrick Mahomes is in the game, they're going to win this game. I don't care who they have the receiver, Travis Kelsey or Travis Swift. He can get hurt. It doesn't matter. <laughs> as long as Patrick Mahomes is in the game, they're going to win this game. Yeah, I'm a, I'm a Niner fan, so hearing that doesn't uh, – <laughs> well, I get it. It's Patrick Mahomes. That guy, even watching him yesterday, some of the plays he made, is like, wow, how are you even getting that pass off? He's amazing. Yeah, and he has yeah. he has like the best defense he's ever had. Yeah, behind I mean, him right now. Yeah, score a point yesterday yeah. in the second half. So didn't score a point. Chris Jones. Oh my goodness, he he's they they're gonna have to pay that man. They wish they would have signed him before this year because he's on a one year deal, like I yeah. think nineteen twenty million dollars, and they can't put the franchise tag on him. They're gonna they should have just paid him coming into the last off season because they're gonna have to pay. He's gonna have to be he's gonna be the highest defensive player, highest paid defensive player in uh, NFL history. That's how good he is. He's a nightmare. Yeah, he's, a, he's yeah. the one I'm worried about the most, especially he wrecked the Niners back in 2019 and that late in that game. Yeah. So yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. He can play. He can play. <laughs> Are you willing to give us a great cup prediction? Whoa, it's too slow. No, no. <laughs> okay, just no, one. Hey, no, I, sometimes people love to give their not too no. early, too early predictions. So no, just give me the you stage know if you wanted to. I'll give you a prediction. This will be the first year. And I'm not going to say from which, from which, uh, from which uh, league or which side that the crossover team make it to the Grey Cup. Prediction I'm giving. All right. There's going to be a crossover team from east to west or west to east that's going to make it to the Grey Cup. I like that. We are gonna clip that. There it is. There it is. <laughs> Remember that. that. <laughs> Remember that. Now, we we seen Remember the east. That. Catch, we seen the east catch up to a bit to the west last season, so. It'll yeah. be interesting I'm this predicting year. predicting right there. A crossover team will make it to the Great Cup. That's what I'm predicting. <laughs> yep. uh, Milt, we can't thank you enough for joining us. Uh, like I said, you left us with so many great memories uh, in that stadium and in this city. Like you said, not just on the football field, but you were such a valued member of the community and you changed people's lives. So, like, I, I can go on and on. I can list stats and your trophies, but just you are – a Winnipegger, and uh, we can't thank y'all enough. Like, no, thank you guys. Thank you for all the support. Uh, I mean, my time in Winnipeg was like no other. I mean, my youngest son, who's 15 now, was born there. He, he always shows his birth certificate. People are like, what the heck is that? Winnipeg, Manitoba. But he's so proud of being born there. And as I said before, signing in 1995 changed my life. And I uh, thank you guys, and I thank everyone throughout Winnipeg, throughout Manitoba, for allowing me uh, to be adopted and become a Winnipeg or so. Thank you guys very much. No, thank you.
Much love. But we can't let you go without Uh-oh. doing, I know you don't drink. We're very aware of that. But we do mm-hmm. something called quick shots at the end of the show where we ask you okay. five quick questions. Don't worry. They're not dirty. They're totally friendly. It's all good. Have some water. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> uh, just give us the first answer that comes to the top of your head. All right. I got you. Favorite CFL city as a visiting opponent? Regina. Favorite CFL city as a visiting opponent? Regina. Okay. <laughs> Least favorite city as a visiting opponent? Regina. <laughs> we got to break that open. Hold on. It's like funniest teammate ever. Uh, Charles Roberts. <laughs> if you were caught in a back alley brawl and needed help, who would be the first teammate you'd call? Rombie Bryant. Oh, right on. Rombie Bryant. Yes. <laughs> no joke. Toughest DB yeah. that you ever played against. A guy named Gerald Vaughn. I don't know if you guys remember him. Gerald yes. Vaughn. Yep. Absolutely. Yep. Mm-hmm. Wow. So let's just unpack that. Favorite city, Regina. Least favorite city, Regina. What's up with him? You know what? And I don't miss playing football, but I miss that Labor Day classic, the mm-hmm. atmosphere. And I know they catch a plane there now, but we used to catch a bus. And once we got close into town and we have fans from Winnipeg, from all over Manitoba, fans from Saskatchewan, Regina, it was just such a crazy atmosphere. But also during the game, some of the stuff the fans, there wasn't anything malicious, but some of the stuff they used to stay, say, and before 2002, we were staying in a hotel in Regina, but the fans would come running down our hallways, waking us up three, four o'clock in the morning. So after that, we had to stay in Moose Jaw. So <laughs> they were the fans I loved to hate and hated to love. So there it is. I love that. That's why I had to double check. I was like, <laughs> maybe I said that question wrong. Let me say it again. You but said thank- it right. You said it right. <laughs> you love that. But thank you again. And again, much love from Winnipeg. Yeah, yeah thank you very what much. Else can I say? Yes, thank you so yes, much. Thank you, God. Yes. And from the famous words of LeVar Burton. We'll see you next time. There it is. (laughs) Hey, friends and neighbors, don't forget to check us out online on Facebook, TikTok, Instagram, and Twitter at Ray Denny Sports. And don't forget to check out our YouTube channel. Leave a like, leave a comment, tell us what you think.